Good evening. I'm delighted to have an opportunity here tonight to talk to you about my experiences uh, in the justice system and with prisoners and ex-prisoners. Um, I suppose staying on the theme of education. Um, my real education started when I uh, got involved with meeting people on what I call the H2H, human-to-human -to -human contact. And, you know, when we talk about education and when we talk about that human-to-human -human contact, like, what is education? Education is the search for truth. And what is the truth in this area? Technology is not playing with us here. So, I, as Darren has said, was a prison officer for 10 years. And uh, who and what did I see when I went in there? I saw social issues. 70% of people that I met within the prison system were locked up um, with issues attached to where they were for non-violent crime. And this is something that's not talked about. Sensationalism and all the newspapers and the whole lot talk about an, a different aspect. But 70% are locked up for non-violent crime, or who I met, um, and I think the figure is, is close to that anyway. And what I would have met with people on, the, on prison landings was deprivation, poverty, as John has already mentioned, 97 to 98%. Who are we locking up? People from the two lowest socioeconomic groups. So, I suppose, what else did I meet? Mental health issues, addiction issues, um, people who are in desperate situations, who had backstories that you won't forget, that you can't forget. But nobody looks at that. We have empathy when we talk about homelessness. We have empathy when we talk about um, addiction. We have empathy when we talk about mental health issues. But when you become a prisoner or an ex-prisoner, suddenly that empathy is withdrawn in many cases. Why is that? The stigma attached to being the body, those people in there. And I suppose what I try to do and what UCASA tries to do is to step into that human-to-human -human contact and support people out of where they are. We don't not look at what they've done. We look at that. That needs to be looked at. And they need to own that. So we encourage them to own it. But we don't define them by that. That's not their future. That's their past. They need to take a look through restorative justice processes, the impact that they've had on the, on the victims the impact that they've had on their family and their friends. So, I suppose I left the prison service in 2008. I walked out and I started from the boot of a car. And like people leaving the prison service, we really had nothing as an organization. And it's been a constant struggle since then. As I see there's a lot of people in the room who are in the zone will know. It's very, very hard to get funding in this area because it's not one of those sexy cells, if you like. But we started with a process of key working, an interagency approach, using the, the agencies that were out there to engage people uh, and, and, and solve the social issues that were there. Um, we started a thing called the Change of Mind Programme, which is basically for everybody, not just for prisoners or ex-prisoners. It's to change the mind of people in the way that they work or see prisoners and ex-prisoners. And then we introduced people to the world of work. We did reverse job fairs where we brought in the employers and encouraged them to take a chance and to see uh, whether they would you know, give a placement or an opportunity to somebody. We all need opportunity. We all need somebody to give us a helping hand. And as John has said, that hand in hand process where we walk with people through the falls and the slips and the stuff that's going to happen because it's going to happen. It's not going to be an easy ride. You have to be able to go through that and come to the other end. And that's about belief. It's about giving people time. It's about compassion. And it's about believing in the success of people and the goodness in people. And we found at UCASA that that's what happens. Four out of five people who come to us succeed. That's a reversal of the stats. So it does work. 
<clears throat> so where do we start? Belief and hope, behavioral programs. I've already mentioned them, restorative justice, but also opportunities to go and do physical activity, affecting men mental health, getting access to a placement, getting access to training and education, literacy, 50% of people within the prison population either illiterate or semi-illiterate. So we have to start there. And if you want to be an astronaut, yes, you can be that. But you've got to start here. And it's that mapping out that plan and stepping with them every step of the way. And saying things like, simple things like, I believe in you. Because it's amazing, the supposed hardened criminals that are sent to us, it's amazing their response, their emotive response to that. When you tell them that you believe in them. Because they've never been told that before. It's never happened before. They've never had those supports. Occupation and purpose, can't say enough about it. We all need it. We all need occupation and we all need a purpose. So we need something to drive towards, that light at the end of the tunnel, that reason to get up in the morning and not coming out, as Nolene has said, to a situation where you're back into the same people, places and things and the same process and back into prison within six or 12 months. How do we change that cycle? We've got to give people something to do. We've got to actively listen to what it is that they want to do. As John was alluding to as well, there's no point in saying here, we're gonna turn wood all day. That's no good to me. I don't want that. I'm not gonna get a job from that. So we've got to listen to people and build individual plans that are real to people that give them a purpose in, in following the plan. So what happens then? A very, very strange thing happens then. People dare to dream, and their dream begins. Richie has been good enough to let us share his story here tonight. Richie came to me, had been through every institution as a child from six years of age. But he told us a story about his grandfather. He used to be a beekeeper. <coughs> and he remembered the smells, the sounds, you know, the smell of the field and the, the, the heather and the, the sounds of the hum of the bees in the, in, the, in, the, in the beehives, the taste of that honey on toast with his granddad when he got back to the house. He lost his granddad, he lost his house. He ended up in mental health services, he meant, ended up in every children's institution, Ferry House, Trinity House, the whole lot. And he ended up in jail. And when he was referred to me, people said that there was no real hope. The people who, who referred him to me, said the services said that there was no real hope for Richie because it was so, his situation was so bad. But where is Richie today? Sorry, I'll go back one. Richie has started a micro business, one of many that has been started through UCASA, and he now runs a company called Be Sure Honey. He employs himself, and he's about to employ with 56 hives when he harvests in September other people, somebody who had never worked before. So this stuff works. It's what works, believing in people, the simplistic things. And I'm being pressured here because I'm over time, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much.